Hi there, this is Joe again, back with you for week three. I'm going to speak here just for a few minutes on the topic in the Blackburn book, chapter three on free will. Now there's a lot that could be said here uh, in philosophy other than the concept of mind. Um, perhaps the idea of autonomy or freedom or the nature of the will would be another dominant uh, topic of debate and discussion uh, going back to Plato and Aristotle all the way up through the, through the modern period into the late modern period. So the Blackburn chapter three uh, is an interesting kind of rambling discussion of fatalism or determinism on the one hand which is that we don't really have free will at all, all is set. And then on the other hand, you have something like indeterminism, which is a kind of radical freedom to choose between opposites. And then Blackburn himself proposes something in the middle called compatibilism, in which freedom and restraint or freedom and determinism are somehow compatible. And he goes through a variety of variety of, of compatibilisms, which he calls revised compatibilism and revised revised compatibilism. So anyway, I leave that up to you to go through the details. I think the overall tenor of the chapter and of the discussion is basically true to the matter, meaning that if you are a pessimist by temperament, um, you will be more likely or inclined to adopt something like a determinism of some sort or another. Uh, and people do adopt this without even realizing it. He brings up a great discussion uh, or example of this on page, let me find it really fast. I think it's page 108. Um, it's page 110. I'm just going to read from the book. It's an excellent example of lots of people who, in ordinary discourse, will talk like this. I know of them personally. He says on page 110, I knew an old man who had been an officer in the First World War. He told me that one of his problems had been to get men to wear their helmets when they were at risk of enemy fire. Their argument was in terms of a bullet having your number on it. If a bullet had your number on it, then there was no point in taking precautions, for it was going to kill you. On the other hand, if no bullet had your number on it, then you were safe for another day, and it did not need, and you did not need, excuse me, and you did not need to wear the cumbersome and uncomfortable helmet. So this is an example of fatalism that creeps into our uh, almost unconscious thinking about how we should behave in the world and in relation to others. Um, I was just talking to a friend a couple of days ago, for example, and he really loves whiskey and cigars. And he has a cigar and steak Friday that he enjoys. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying whiskey and cigars, of course. Uh, I'm not puritanical in that way at all. But I said, oh, cigars are really harsh and they can lead to mouth cancer really easily. Um, I guess I was being a bit of a downer. I didn't say anything about the whiskey. I just said something about cigars. And uh, he just dismissed it and said, oh, there's too many factors. If I'm going to get cancer, I'm going to get cancer. Just, I'm not going to change my behavior. Um, and I just, I didn't say anything back. I said, oh, okay. I just think, what a, what a bizarre response to a health threat. I mean, we're not talking about him like, you know, getting a common cold. I'm talking about him getting cancer, which can kill you. I'm talking about the very existence of your life. And he didn't seem like he needed to modulate or reform or think about dangerous behaviors like regular cigar smoking. <clears throat> or if he was going to smoke cigars regularly, at least he knew he was putting his life at risk. And it wasn't just, you know, up to the fates whether he would live or die. I said, well, there's pretty direct causality there. If you stop smoking cigars, 
the likelihood of you getting mouth cancer plummets, it drops way down. Uh, pretty common sense, you would think. Anyway, this kind of fatalism, though, creeps into our thinking regularly, and I think the chapter really challenges this. But the chapter also challenges the fact that sometimes we think we're master and commander of our fate, as if there are no restraints whatsoever. And as I put in the, in the note about your reading assignment on Moodle, um, can you do whatever you want? Of course you can't. Can you go climb Mount Everest? No, I don't think any of us could go climb Mount Everest. Yes, we have the choice to go purchase a climbing ticket and to go purchase all the clothing we need and give it a shot, but we'll probably die or get really injured. Uh, so none of us is really free to do what we want. Maybe we are free to stab our best friend with a knife. Sorry about the, the visceral image. Um, I was having a debate with my father about this once, and he was very irked that I thought we don't have complete and utter freedom uh, and agency to do whatever we want anytime we want. And of course, you could pick up a knife and plunge it into anything you wanted, like you have the physical ability to do that, but there are moral and social restraints that make it nearly impossible for you to exercise that kind of freedom. Sometimes people do, and then they're, you know, punished uh, accordingly. But also, I think there's something about our constitution, the way we're made, our will, our social conditioning that does not allow us. Like, I could not hurt somebody that way. I don't have the freedom to do that. And I'm happy to not have the freedom to do that. Um, so the chapter really tries to chart a middle way between radical freedom and fatalism, really. And so I think that's something to think about is if you think you have agency that's good, you're an optimist and you're not a pessimist. Pessimist, excuse me. A pessimist is over here who thinks we only have, you know, to live up to whatever fate has us and that we should just detach and passively just uh, lie before the fates, lie before determinism, as if the future is already set. Uh, now, that's kind of ridiculous to think the future is set. I mean, how could we know? There is a sort of arrogance in fatalism that somehow we know everything is set. Well, how do you know that? Uh, there's also an arrogance, I think, underlying the opposite, which is that you have complete and utter control and freedom. Uh, your ordinary day will tell you you don't have complete control over whatever you do. Another great example, and I'll end here, I have a seven-year-old son, Jack, and he was so excited yesterday because his regular teacher had to call in sick. And last minute, Jack and a couple of his friends had to go to a classroom where a teacher was so they could take care of the kids for the day. So the kids were broken up in various classrooms. They didn't have a substitute. They didn't have time. And so Jack was so excited. I said, why was the day so good, Jack? And he goes, we could just do whatever we wanted. And he said, really? Wow, you had the freedom to do whatever you want. So what did you do? Well, we read books and we kind of like played. And then, um, you know, then we, then we colored pictures. I said, oh, okay. So I think what he was saying is he could do whatever, what, whatever he wanted within the constraints of the school day and whatever the teacher would allow him to do. So he couldn't do whatever he wanted. He couldn't run down to the store. He couldn't go to the park on his own. He couldn't get on a bus and go to the city center or the downtown. He could do whatever he wanted relative to the context in which he was. And I think that's a pretty good definition of freedom, that we have freedom and agency, but within a context in which there are many obstacles and constraints there. Um, there are, there's another great example of <laughs> determinism gone wrong on page 105 about a Twinkie and a legal case involving a Twinkie, and I suggest you read that. And uh, please do enjoy the, the chapter this week and the discussion board question as well. And it has specific page numbers there for you to read. Thanks and see you next week.